Hello everybody, this is War Story Video Vlog. I am Alex and here we are with Bill Reno in the Holiday Express Hotel that um, gave us this place for to attend our own military antique show with the Japanese swords and uh, we will show you some items uh, from Bill Reno collection uh, two really expensive swords and uh, one of them already sold. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Hey Bill, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Um, I would like to to ask you about uh, some of your items. Could you tell us um, about your three swords? And uh, two of them is really expensive. You told us, and one already sold. And another one is quite rare. And um, um, this top sword is is an interesting sword. Um, it's a uh, it's a sword with uh, two cutting tests. They perform two different test cuts with it um, on these ex execution grounds um, where they did a lot of the, the cutting and they, they tested them on criminals or their cadavers and they would stack, they would bind and stack the bodies um, and, and the test cutter would take them and basically just cut and if it went through in one strike they would, they would document where in the body through the hip through the shoulders, um, head, arms. They would test them with, with different things. This particular one has a, a two-body cutting test and a three-body, meaning they stack three bodies and with one stroke of the sword cut through all three bodies clean. And it was, uh, it happened in the, what century? 1600s. 1600s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at, at a later point, I'd, I'd have to look, but uh, at some point, it, that was only a practice for about 70 years, 80 years, and then they outlawed it, I think. Um, it's hard to understand now uh, yeah. the things, but uh, that was their cultural, maybe. Yeah, it was. It was very. It was a cultural thing. And could you show how to see it, maybe, uh, those aeroglyphs? Uh, the, the, yeah, the gold uh, inscription on the Inscription, the yeah. And to do that, you just carefully take out the pin. You, there's a little tool to pop it out, um, but you don't, on this one, you don't need it. Now this particular sword is a Juyo. It, it has the, the designation of Juyo token. Um, and uh, it was made, also I should note that it was made by two, two very, very, you know, two very famous, one more than other um, smiths. Um, you, re you remove the, the habaki. Here's the, here's the inscription of the cutting test. Three body, two body, cut through, the, cut through. And then this is the tester. This is the guy's name, Masa. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't. I can't read that. I'll have to look it up. But you read very well. I pretty, have, pretty. I have to can. Uh, send you some pictures. <laughs> yeah, for to read. And these are the two smiths that made this blade in collaboration. One was this Kaneshige, who was who was the teacher of uh, Kotetsu, and this other Mino guy, Kanetsuna. Um, and they, they named this blade White Lightning, kind of interesting, probably because it cut through three bodies with, with one stroke. When they were made originally new, the smith would, they call it dress the Nakago with a, with a type of file mark. Um, and they have different names for the different file mark. This is, this isn't, I can't quite, well, on an older sword you can't, it's sometimes difficult to see. But this one was probably like a full, full K show where they had a real fancy design. Um, but you can see that each, each one of these, these file mark patterns has a name. And uh, is it just a trace of uh, 
Yeah, what the, that's interesting. What those are is when the sword was polished, the polisher leaves like a burnish mark. Those are, those are he uses little burnishing rods and he, he creates these lines by burnishing the steel. Mm -hmm. And that, that little line is underneath the habaki and then up at the top of the blade, up near the kisaki, the same, you can uh, maybe see them. Yeah, we'll see. And the polisher basically, uh, he, he does those lines. It's kind of like a signature, but not really. It's just a little extra, um, just a little extra detail that they do. And uh, how often you can see the cutting tests uh, blades? It's pretty rare. Um, and sometimes you find them and they're fake. Mm -hmm. they, they've been faked, you know. They'll put a fake inscription on the on the Nicago, but the gold inlaid cutting tests are pretty rare. And uh, how you can difference? Uh, how you how can you know that it's fake or not? Is there's a kind of a you have to study them. There's a a certain way that they did it. Um, maybe if you can come up here and look at it from there's a little piece of gold missing from part of it. Um, the way that they, you see that right, right there, there's a little piece of gold missing from part of the inlaid inscription. The way they cut these was similar to a, like a dovetail, the, the deeper you go in. So the cut it, the out part, outside part of it is, is narrower and the inside part slants, slants in. Do you know what I mean? Like a, mm -hmm. like a bevel. Like a tail. Oh. Yeah, like a do dovetail yes. on the inside. Yeah. And then they would push the gold in and then burnish it off on the top. And sometimes the, the fake ones are just a line cut in, straight line, and then they push in the gold and mm -hmm. burnish it off. And then the, 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 cut, the cutting tester um, would inscribe their name on it too. And, and with signatures, um, a lot of times it's in books, you're, you're basically comparing stroke for stroke. Every stroke in the kanji amazingly is pretty consistent throughout a swordsmith's career. Sometimes they did change their signature a little bit, um, but those changes are consistent for each period that he worked in. Um, he, would, he would sign his name a certain way and literally every stroke of the chisel was exactly the same each time he cut it. Mm -hmm. So you can compare and know that... Yeah, you know, yeah there's, there's reference books with, you know, three pages of signatures on this guy. Okay. Um, Another, another way to, to know if it looks close, and I've had this happen, and you send it to Japan to the sword museum, and they look at it and they're like, it's not good, it's, it's gime or false signature. Or they confirm what you think, that it's, that it's, a, uh, it's a, a true signature, a real signature of the guy who made the sword. Did you send it? No, no, this was, this, this one, I, I got at auction. Oh, and this already has papers. Yeah, it was, it was papered and polished. Uh -huh. um, the one below it was also papered and polished. And uh, can we see this one? Yeah, the one below is quite a bit older. Um, this one was made by this, this swordsmith, Nori, Norishige. He was, he was uh, one of Masamune's 10 great disciples or 10 great swordsmith students. Um, and this guy's work was pretty distinct, and you'll see in a minute why. Um, this sword was made around in the, in the Nambokcho period, like in the early 1300s. Oh, um, quite early. Yeah, and this this Norimitsu worked in a, a very it's a very Soshu style jigane, and it's called Mitsukawahara. And you, 
if you zoom in, you, you can see, uh, I mean, it's really, really crazy. It's like a crazy Damascus pattern. And then can you see the swirls in the, of martensite crystalline structure in the temper line? Pattern of the grain. Mm -hmm. And you see, it almost looks like, it almost looks like glitter. Yeah. That's called Nie. The little lines that you're seeing running through there, the little Nie, strings of Nie, they're called uh, Sunagashi and Kintsuji. And then there's, there's, there's dark, dark lines you'll see coming off the top of the homone. Those are known as uh, chike, chike. Mm -hmm. And it's a point of quality too, or just? Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, it was to get that with no flaws, no openings, no, no uh, blisters, or remember I told you the little kizu, the blister mm -hmm. in the steel? To, to get this without, without those things, like you notice there's a little bit of looseness in this grain, the, the little loose spots in the grain. That looseness is from being polished. Mm -hmm. It's not from initially having forging flaws. You can see microscopic pitting mm -hmm. that the polisher chose not to take out because it would remove too much steel. Yeah. You know, to preserve the life of the sword, to, to keep the life of the sword. Mm -hmm. See, like these, that was a rust pit that didn't come out and polish that he chose not to take out. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful blade. It's a... Yeah, stunning. Here, you can see, this is a prime example of Kintsuji here. You see the little lines, the little, mm -hmm. the little strings? That's Kintsuji that formed. They're little martensite crystalline structures that formed along the pattern of the grain. Yeah, that's interesting. And there is a, this. Yep. And that actually, that might actually be from a sword strike. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the reason the blade was originally shortened. It's probably battle damage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the back of the blade, you'll see what they call kirikome, kira, kirikome, and they're sword cuts. You can actually see a strike. My other Kamakura period blade, the Tachi in there, has a kirikome on the, mm -hmm. on the, the spine of the blade. When they, when they hardened it, they clay coat it. And when they hardened it, um, the clay had a different thickness on the cutting edge. So the cutting edge would cool quicker. And what would happen is you'd get martensite crystalline structure that formed on the cutting edge, causing it to be a harder, harder surface. Well, on the back portion of the blade, the, the steel was softer. Um, and that's all wrapped around a, a higher carbon, softer steel in the center, um, which made them pretty unique. They, they, uh, they didn't chip, they didn't bend often, they didn't break often. Um, and you can actually cut steel with these things. I've actually done it in Japan. I've cut uh -huh. steel with, uh, with a sword, modern made sword, modern made sword. And could you show a description on this sword? Yeah, this is the, the Sayagaki. This one was done by Mr. Tanabe, the former director of the NBTHK. NBTHK, it means sword museum, yeah? Yeah, Nihon Tobijitsu uh, Hozan Kyokai, which is the uh, sword museum in Japan, basically. Bijitsu is, is museum. And then the other side is the full full description of the blade, the length, um, the uh, jigane, uh, the type of homon, the activity in the homon, and then at the top, of course, it's the smith, the smith who made it. And uh, these symbols we can see on the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, y you'll see just the bottom two signal. The bottom two kanji, which is nori mitz, nori nori shige, sorry, and that's done. In this one, it's a it's a gold lacquer attribution, um, and the Japanese call it uh, uh, kinpunmei. Kin is the word for gold in Japanese.
the Nakago on this one is 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 just as impressive as the other one, um, but quite simple. The gold good. lacquer signature. Um, about habaki. Okay, the habaki. Yeah. Is a copper copper based habaki. Um, with a with a, it's a two piece two individual pieces. Uh, made the base base is copper with a, uh, a thin layer of gold foil that's wrapped around it and then burnished in on a cut uh, on a little cutout on the inside of the on the inside of the habaki so that it doesn't catch on the blade it's actually flat on the inside this is a single piece gold foil but this one is a, a two piece gold foil habaki and the fit is is quite amazing. I mean, the tolerances are really, really. Oh, wow. It's it's basically f friction fit. This is actually an old habaki. I can tell by the verdigris. But this is a two piece gold foil habaki. They call it a niju niju habaki. Two piece, and, and it's so tight. I mean. It'll take me a few seconds to get it back together because it's like a puzzle. The tolerances are, I mean, it's amazingly, amazingly tight. And all of these, all of the guys and the file marks are all different directions, you notice? Mm -hmm. They're opposite directions. That's the proper proper way that these are filed a straight roof is like this uh -huh. a straight mune would be like this uh -huh. this is what they call a mitsumune uh -huh. do you see the little flat spot on the top uh -huh. and that's characteristic of, of the school that this came out of soshu can you see it on the top of the blade yeah on the top of the mm, the little flat Mm -hmm. And then on the top of the sword, it's also flat. The habaki matches the blade. Mm -hmm. It's called mitsumune. But you told it very simple. What did you mean? Well, the, the design is really simple, but it's pretty complicated how they're made. It's like um, a de devil in a yeah, minors. Yeah, I mean... Uh, how to correct it? Devil in the... Oh, the devil's in the details. Ah, in details, minors. <laughs> but like this one, this one on a high quality hibaki, um, it's, it's fit to the blade, even to the inside of the grooves. Yeah, of this part. It actually fits tight in that groove, and, and there's a way to... You know, you have to put the, when you put the habaki on, you have to slide it into the groove from back here, you know, and they, then it'll go on and it, and it almost, it like snaps into place almost. They're so tight. Mm -hmm. And this is the type of sign. Yeah, this is a kinpun mei. It's gold lacquer over the, and th this, this kinpun mei is probably 400 years old. Mm-hmm. You know this attribution it, it might be anywhere from 400 to 150 years old because 400 years ago it already was old. yeah yeah and shortened when they shortened mm -hmm. it it lost the signature the original signature was somewhere right probably right about here this might or might not be the original hole um, it's hard to say whether this is originally where the hole was or this 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 might have been the original hole, which means the signature would have been somewhere a little bit lower, maybe down here. Mm -hmm. And and they they changed the shape of the blade um, when they when they shortened it. So, but if you follow the geometry of the sword, um, if you actually follow the geometry of the sword, you can see that this is where the curvature started because the hamon, the temper line, runs into the, into the Nakago. You can kind of see it in the, the patination, the patina, the hardening that's it's pretty difficult to see it. But you'll see it's a little brighter. Yeah. But it ends right about here, which means the curvature, when they moved it up, they reshaped the Nakago downwards 
and the hamon would have continued, you know, on the upper part where my finger is, the cutting edge would have continued till probably about here, maybe or here. It's very interesting. And uh, this word already sold, and how much it was? Uh, $100,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one with cutting tests? Uh, this one is about $90,000. $90,000. And um, about that word, if uh, it will be without cutting tests, mm -hmm. uh, how much it will, it will be in uh, without a cutting the test? same condition, yes. By Kaneshige, uh, just Kaneshige, if it was Juyo, might be about sixty-five, seventy-five thousand mm dollars -hmm. This particular sword has kind of all the, the bells and whistles if you want a Japanese sword. It has a name, um, it was made by Tooth Smiths, it has a cutting test, but not just one cutting test, but two cutting tests. Um, and it's, it's in fantastic condition. It's really healthy, real thick, beefy blade, thick, beefy hamon. This sword's probably only been polished maybe two or three times since it was made. Um, this sword might Is it have, many times or...? No, or not? not really. Not really considering 17, 18, 19. It's, you know, considering it's 400 years old. A polish, even if you care for it, really only lasts about well, most of the time, a polish, even if you care for it, only lasts about 250 maybe years, 300 years. Um, but if it's extremely well cared for, you know, it could last 500 years. Um, but you don't, just because it maybe has some little bit of darkening starting to happen, a little oxidation, not necessarily rust, but the steel will get darker over time you don't go and polish it because the polishing process, they're actually removing metal. Um, and a sword can only take so many polishes before it starts to open up. The grain gets looser and looser and it starts to delaminate. Okay. This sword, considering it was made in the 1300s, is, is in really, really good condition. It's also very healthy. Um, and it's good for your customer. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, really I mean, it's cool. fantastic. It's probably one but of is it, is the it better big, examples. Big collection, of yeah. big collection of swords. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Very, very nice. So, now we heard about swords. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, I hope you will tell us uh, about some of your another items that yeah. now in a room, and we yeah. will bring bring it here. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, interview and this um, review, short review of this words. And we are we are waiting your comments under the video. Uh, subscribe this channel. Uh, say us hello and see you next time. Bye bye.